Welcome, sport management students, to episode three of our Zoomcast series, Interviews with Professionals. And today we're really, really, really lucky um, to have with us Mike Drozzi. And most of you might know him better as Duke the Dumpster Drozzi, former WWF superstar. So, Mike, thanks for being here with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on the show. I look forward to this. Great, great. And again, Mike, these Zoomcasts are kind of a way for our freshman students in sport management um, to kind of be exposed to different careers, opportunities, and interests that they might have or they might not even know about in the sport industry. And this is kind of an opportunity to help motivate, inspire, maybe share a new pathway with them. So I like inviting guests on. And, and the main thing is, is to be able to share your story. So with that being said, um, I'd love to hear a little bit of uh, uh, your story and how you got to where you are. Well, you know, it's, it's been an interesting path. <clears throat> um, you know, when I was growing up, I, I always watched wrestling. I, lived, I grew up down in Miami, Florida, and I watched championship wrestling from Florida with Gordon Soley. I was a big fan of the guys like Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair and Black Jack Mulligan and Kevin Sullivan and all these old school great wrestlers. And, you know, I was always such a fan. And I remember by the time I got to high school, I was really into all the wrestlers. I was watching the WC, well, the NWA, WCW show out of Georgia and all these things. And um, then this, this, this show occurred called WrestleMania. WrestleMania one, it was the very first WrestleMania and it came out of New York by this guy named Vince McMahon. And I remember <clears throat> my dad took me to see the show and uh, there was no pay-per-view in those days. You know, this is like 1984, 85. And uh, we had to go to an arena and watch it on a closed circuit television in Miami, Florida. That's how it worked. And I just remember all the hype and, and you know, the way Vince McMahon put that show together was different than anything that I'd ever seen. And it was really amazing to me, uh, the way they promoted the show, promoted the wrestlers, uh, and it was really exciting to see. And I just remember at one point during that show, I stood up and turned and looked at my dad and I said, I'm gonna be a professional wrestler. Um, so that's where it all started with me wanting to be a wrestler. I was an athlete in high school. I was an amateur wrestler. Um, you know, I qualified for the state my senior year, and I only wrestled two years in high school. I, I started when I was a junior, but um, what ended up happening is my senior year after the wrestling season, the Florida wrestlers, championship wrestling from Florida, came and did a show at our gym as a fundraiser for the wrestling team. So there was guys like Lex Luger and Barry Windham and all these guys there, and um, my dad asked around and found out where there was a school and uh, he found out and there was one in Miami near where we lived and right there still when I was a senior in high school I, I started training to become a professional wrestler. I probably had my first match six months after I started training. Um, you know, I just I knew what I wanted to do. There was no doubt and that was the plan. But I also went to college, you know, I went to the University of Miami and graduated with an undergraduate degree in criminal justice. And uh, because just to, my mom always wanted me to have something to fall back on, but sure. I did that all along. I was still wrestling on the side at the local shows and I just kept building, building up and building up a, a resume, if you will. And um, what ended up happening is right when I was graduating from the University of Miami in 1993, I had, uh, I had created this character in wrestling down there in Florida called the Garbage Man, Rocco Gibraltar. And I had marketed myself, I had put together, everything I ever did, I put on videotape. And back then it was VHS tapes. Everything I ever did, I put on videotape. So at one point, me and my brother sat down and created this promotional video. I did a promo, like an interview, I'm coming soon to wrestle, you know, like all wrestlers do. And um, then I had a highlight reel where I kind of cherry picked all these high spots and big moves out of each tape. I went through meticulously, went through all these tapes. And we created this amazing creation, mostly out of luck. Um, and I had this promo package put together and the plan was I made like 30 of them. And I was gonna drive all across the country 
trying to market myself to all the different promotions that were still up and running. Well, then what happened one day is I was working at this job at a private beach club on a Key Biscayne, which is in Miami, and uh, rich people that owned homes on this island were members. And anyway, I was reading the paper before work one evening, and there was an article in the paper about they were interviewing Hulk Hogan, who had just gotten ready to change over to WCW. He had left the WWF, and it was during the steroid scandal when the feds were trying to accuse Vince McMahon of distributing steroids and all this craziness was going on in the business. And they had this interview with Hulk Hogan at the Miami beach convention center. Uh, incidentally, which is the same place I watched WrestleMania one, but they were having a TV executive convention there and Hogan gave him an interview. And then the last sentence in that article that I read was Vince McMahon, who was also in attendance, had no comment. I realized Vince McMahon was in my hometown. So at that moment, I immediately started to hatch a plan. How am I going to get in there and get up and get some face time with Vince McMahon? Yeah. So I took what, ended, what uh, I ended up finding out is one of these rich beach club members was a TV executive at the local channel too. And my boss called him and asked if he could get me in. And he said he could do one better. He gave me his executive credentials. So I put on a suit. I wore this guy's TV executive credentials like as an executive for Channel 2 in Miami, Florida. And I walked right in the front door of this NatP convention. And I walked right up to Vince McMahon, stuck out my hand, shook his hand, introduced myself, and explained to him why I wanted to wrestle in the World Wrestling Federation. Pitched him for about a minute. He asked me a couple of questions. And then I got the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> I was gone. And I didn't give myself time to think about it. I just, I jumped on the opportunity. It hatched overnight. It was an amazing plan that just came together overnight. I didn't have time to talk myself out of it. And that's how I got hired by the World Wrestling Federation. And they changed my name to Duke the Dumpster Drosy. That is an absolutely amazing story. Um... And also, um, just on the sheer nostalgia side for me, um, you were you were just mentioning a whole lot of wrestlers that I grew up loving, um, the Lex Luger's, the Ric Flair's, the Harley Races, the Hulk Hogan's, yeah. um, all of that phenomenal. But you hit on one thing that I really want to kind of get back to a little bit, and we talk about the importance in sport management in the sport industry and in the sport entertainment industry about. Um, networking, connecting, um, and, and making your own luck. And that's kind of what you did with that entire story was making your own luck. So if you had to say, if there was like one break or one milestone or one experience that really put your life onto that trajectory, um, do you know what that could be? Or was it that story with Vince McMahon? I, I would say definitely that meeting with Vince McMahon changed yeah. everything. Um, I, I didn't really have any friends or family up in the business at that time. So I had to make that opportunity happen. Yeah. There was no other way for me to get in because I did not know anybody there. Uh, I was just, you know, I was this guy working quietly down on some spot shows in Florida up until that time. And not really many people. The independent scene is nothing like it is now. Back then it was nothing like this. And, and there wasn't social media. There wasn't even Internet yet. Yeah. So there's none of that. <clears throat> so. Nobody knew who I was, and uh, I, I had to make that happen. So that was probably the biggest event that really kind of catapulted me in that direction and, and, and got my foot in that door, absolutely. Yeah, I, I really appreciate hearing that story, and I think my students will too, because I think they're so used to, um, when we look at the sport industry and all the different careers in it, we always look, or they always hear that common phrase, it's who you know. Um, and that's something that's it's kind of ingrained into us. But, you know, that's half the battle. It is who you know, but it's also um, making your own luck for yourself like you did. Um, so I really like, I really appreciate that story. Yeah, and I think it's also who you meet and how you present yourself more so than who you know. You may not, you may not know anybody, but you may walk up to the right person. And if you present yourself in the right fashion and you're well-spoken and, uh, you know, you pitch them really well, like I did Vince, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, you can make a new friend in the industry. That's, that's excellent. Um, 
I want to get on to the next question because I know, again, your, your time is valuable here. Um, besides, you know, I, I have a lot of students that, again, aren't sure what they want to do as a career. And uh, they know they love sport, they love sport entertainment, whatever capacity that is. And a lot of them do enjoy professional wrestling. But besides actually being a professional wrestler, looking at the industry of professional wrestling, it's a, it's a billion dollar industry. Um, were you ever exposed or can you tell us about any other careers within professional wrestling besides being a wrestler? Well, I wrestled in the, the early to mid nineties and it was a, a lot different then than it is now. Sure. Uh, it was still considered like a mom and pop organization. The McMahon family owned it by themselves. It was not publicly traded. It was not a billion dollar company. Uh, so there was a lot fewer jobs, even though they had a huge building and a lot of people working there, don't get me wrong. Um, now there's so many other positions, you know, producers, writers, and all these things we didn't, we were our own writers. Pretty much, I mean, they would come to you with an idea, but then you go out there and make it happen. Now they write everything for everybody. They script everything and they need people to do all that stuff. Um, they need PR people, you know, public public relations people, they need, you know, all of these types of positions to push their brand. You know, Vince McMahon is all about pushing WWE as a brand. And uh, the more you can help him do that, I mean, heck, you can even create your own position somehow in that company that would help him to that end. And he'll bring you in because <coughs> Vince McMahon and that family have always been outside the box thinkers. And that's why he's always been so successful. Uh, and if you come to him with that mindset and, and give him something that he thinks he needs, then you could even create your own position. And it's just, that's the way this business is. It's very creative all the way around. But yeah, there's a lot of different positions now as compared to when I was there, it was kind of just a very few spots and wrestlers, managers as talent. And then there was backstage producers, agents, but there wasn't writers really, there wasn't any of that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Again, um, I, I've grown up, uh, I followed the NWA when I was young and then I merged into the WWE and uh, the WWF and the Monday Night Wars. And it's, it's an absolutely phenomenal industry on where it has came from and what it is today. And especially what the McMahons have done for uh, sports entertainment, professional wrestling, it's amazing. Um, I never in a thousand years would have thought it'd be as big as it is today. And um, yeah, it's, it's gotten a lot bigger and it's, you know, I always, I always like to say kind of half kiddingly, but not kidding is, you know, a lot of guys like me broke our backs building that company to what it is now. I take pride. I take a certain amount of pride in that because when I was there, it was not, the, the money was down, you know, it was just on the tail end of that ster steroid scandal when a lot of people were jumping ship to WCW and that's when the Monday Night War started. So business was down. So yeah, it has come back so unbelievably well. And that, you know, it's all Vince McMahon. He is a genius when it comes to that. So, so you know. Well, I wanna, a couple more questions here, if you don't mind. Um, and I want to, I want to kind of, and this might be for me more than the students, um, but mm -hmm. I'll also enjoy it. Um, you know, you had uh, a very interesting career where you had the opportunity to wrestle against guys that my students would know, like Triple H and um, X Pac and Bam Bam Bigelow and Big Van Vader, and the list goes on. And um, I was scrolling through a couple of your matches the other day, and I, I think you might be the only person they can say that they beat Triple H 11 times or 12 times. And I know there are shows, but I, I don't know if that's happened, has it? I, I don't know if I beat him 11 or 12 times. Maybe if you count all the house shows. Yeah. A lot of, what, a, what a lot of people are saying is I was the first person to ever beat Triple H. But the funny thing about that, the funny thing about that story is I wrestled him on this thing called the free for all. Free for all was a free match on pay-per-view before the actual pay-per-view match started. Okay. Me and Triple H wrestled in a match to decide the winner of which, ugh, the winner of that match got to be the number 30 contestant in the Royal Rumble. Mm. Number 30 is the best because you're the freshest when you go out yeah. there. You're the last guy to go out there. You're in the best shape. Number one is the worst because you got to last the whole time in the Rumble okay. when everybody else comes. So I wrestled him. He hit me with brass knuckles at the end, knocked me out. 
pinned me. Gorilla Monsoon was the commissioner at the time. He came out and turned over the decision because it was cheating. Yeah. And I won by disqualification. Now, mind you, I didn't pin Triple H in that match. Yeah. But yeah, that was the first time he lost. Um, then we went on a long run of getting ready for the, the pay-per-view we were going to do together. It was an in-your-house pay-per-view. It was called In Your House. But I mean, we must have wrestled for months up building up to that in house shows. And we probably split back and forth 50-50 on all the house shows, winning and losing uh, and trying different things. But yeah, they say I was the first person to beat him, but I didn't pin it. But I, That's yeah, I awesome. beat him. That's a great story. Um, so along those lines, and this might be the answer to this, might not. Um, you've worked with a lot of different professional wrestlers and you've worked with a lot of different talent. Um, favorite person to work with? Mm. You know, it's funny. Every time I'm asked this question, a lot of times I come up with different answers because there's different reasons. Okay. Um, Triple H was great. I wrestled him a lot. Uh, and he was willing to do anything I wanted him to do because I threw him all over the place <laughs> because I was a power wrestler. I used to do power slams and everything and press, press him over my head and slam him. And he didn't complain a bit. And I knew he, he took a beating when he worked with me. So I have to respect him for that. Um, some of the funnest guys I worked with, Henry Godwin, the hog farmer, Savio Vega, Steve yeah. Austin, when they got a chance to wrestle Stone Cold, we just laughed because we were buddies as it was. We would just laugh in the ring the whole time and have a great time. Those were all fun people to work with, and they were all really great. Everybody at that level was just so good that it made it so easy. So you could just go in there and just have fun, and that's what we did. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Um, okay, I'm not going to ask you your least favorite person to work with. I think that's an appropriate question, but I do want to keep up with the wrestling. Or – I'll tell you. Oh, I, I would. I would love to know. Oh gosh, and I, and and I'm, I must. I must preface this and say he is no longer with us. He recently passed away, and um and I don't and and I don't, I didn't hate him as an individual as a human being, but King Kong Bundy about killed me on several occasions. Uh, matter of fact, there's a, if you watch a match, Duke the Dumpster Drosy versus King Kong Bundy on YouTube, you will see him drop a knee on my face. He almost breaks my nose. He had no control over his weight. And I used to, we used to yell at each other in the locker room. And he goes, shut up and get away from me. And I'd be like, you're stiff, you big tub of lard. And we would just argue. And, and it's funny because he came full circle up until the time he died here recently. I would see him at conventions and stuff. And we still had this kind of, three quarters shoot uh, hatred for each other, but it wasn't real. I mean, we were friends on Facebook and stuff, yeah. but uh, we would just shoot back and forth, but he was rough to work with, man. You know, some guys <laughs> it's a night off. You don't get hurt. But some guys you get in there. It's like you got hit by a Mack truck and uh, he was one of the Mack trucks for sure. That's interesting. I, I remember King Kong Bundy. Well, um, yeah. I wouldn't say he was one of my favorite wrestlers, but I remember his character and I, I yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Grew up in the 80s, 90s, loved it. Um, w w one more wrestling question. I, I kind of want to you know, wrap this up and give us an opportunity to kind of close this out. But one more wrestling question. You know, I mentioned earlier that this has really turned into a, a billion-dollar industry um, and probably more um, worldwide. And there's so much opportunity. There's so much career, er, career opportunities. There's so much money that goes through professional wrestling. Where do you see it going in – 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now? Well, I think it's moving more towards a, a television slash movie production type of thing. Um, you know, with this, the whole COVID-19 situation, with them not being able to have fans, they've been forced to once again think outside of that box and get creative. And they started having like movie type shoots of wrestling matches. I mean, The Undertaker versus AJ Styles, I think was the first yep. um, um, example of that. And I think the, the business in general is going to start moving in that direction, much bigger movie type productions with the matches and the shows and everything. Um, 
and, and as a business, I think it's just going to create more opportunities and more licensing situations and agreements or, and opportunities and all that good stuff and, and more money and billions and billions of more dollars. And so, <laughs> but that, that's where I see it going. Yeah. I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that specific match at, that was at the past WrestleMania, right? The AJ Styles. Yeah. Yes, it was. Um, I really, I, I was curious about how they were going to do that. And um, visually, it looked very good. Um, I, I liked it. I thought it worked out well. So I can completely see where you're coming from with that, where um, that's where this industry might go. With, and for people in sport management program, you know, that could be a good thing because there's going to be a lot more, like you said, PR and marketing and licensing and communications and production. There's going to be a lot of jobs that come with that. So um, very cool. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity here. Uh, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong with this. You, after your wrestling career, were a teacher, correct? Yes. I was a special education teacher for about Excellent. 10 years. Excellent. Um, and one of the parts with me being a teacher and your teaching experience as well is I always like ending, um, classes or courses or things like that with some kinds of words of wisdom or some kind of takeaway that these students can hopefully grasp onto. Do you have any parting lessons for some sport management freshmen in college that are looking to get into the industry that all of that's ahead of them right now is dreams and aspirations? Absolutely. Uh, one thing I'll tell you is, is um, educate yourselves as much as possible. Education in this world is power. There's a lot of people coming out nowadays saying you don't need a college degree to do this, this, and that. And that's okay. That's fine. But... It says something about you when you do the work and you have college degrees and you've worked hard. Um, also, a big one with me, there's a couple. One is don't ever limit yourself to the beliefs and the expectations of other people. Don't, what, don't let what other people think you can do or say you can do paralyze you into doing nothing. That's what happens to so many people. They get caught up in worrying about what the haters think, that they get stuck in doing nothing. Don't become that person. Any negativity brought into your life, you need to get rid of. Get rid of any negativity that comes to you in any way, shape, or fashion. And sometimes it can be difficult because sometimes it's a family member or a situation like that. But you have to have your dream, your ambition, your goals, and that's what you have to work for. And don't let anybody get in your way, okay? Especially not the negative people. And you'll be successful. Just put in the work. I really appreciate that, Mike. That's great advice. Um, with that being said, students, you, you're probably going to see some quiz questions on this. And there's uh, Mike provided with us a lot of great nuggets and a lot of great wisdom here. So I, I really, uh, Mike, I appreciate your time. Um, we wish you the best of luck in any future endeavors and anything that you have going on and moving forward. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a blast. Good. Thank you so much.